Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Thank you. And I'll read John 14, 27. <coughs> Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Well, good, morning. good morning. Good morning. So at the altar call, Robert asked the charismatic traveling preacher to pray for his hearing. After three minutes of intense prayer, and spitting on his fingers, and putting hands in both ears, and saying, in the name of Jesus be healed, hearing be restored. The preacher asked Robert, how's your hearing? <clears throat> Robert replied, I don't know yet. It doesn't take place till Tuesday at the courthouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that brought a little joy. Uh, I try to add a little humor every Sunday to uh, bring some joy. Today we're going to talk about emotions. And joy is one of the emotions God wants us to experience. We'll talk more about that in a minute. I just want to remind you of the series that we're in. Uh, we're talking about holiness, and we're talking about how to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. It says in Mark 12, I'm going to go down to verse uh, 30, where he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. So we're talking about each one of these one week at a time. We did a little break for the celebration thing and a Father's Day message. But I'm looking at this, and I talked about the soul in this context as our spirit. Because we cannot live a holy life until our spirit gets born again. We are born with a dead spirit, a spirit that rebels against God, a spirit that's sinful. So that spirit cannot live a holy life. Until we're born again, we cannot live a holy life. So it begins when we get a new spirit. We get a Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes to live inside our spirit and gives us a new spirit. We need to love God with our spirit. Then the next week I talked about our mind and how we need to get our mind renewed, our mind transformed, our mind going in the right direction. Because our mind does not instantly change when we get born again. Our spirit does, but our mind does not. And it takes the rest of our lives to get that mind renewed, get our mind retrained, and to help our mind go the direction God wants us to go. And today, I'm going to talk about the heart in this context. I'm going to connect it to the emotions. Because in the Bible, there's no actual word called the emotions. You will not find that word in the Bible. There's lots of emotions expressed. There's lots of emotions described, and we're going to talk about that today. But there's never the word emotions in there. So in this context, I'm looking at the heart as what's going on in our emotions. So how many emotions are there? Well, I looked it up, and I got as low as 4 and as high as 27. There's a range there. Let's talk about those two extremes. The bottom four from verywellmind.com, they say there's an irreducible core of four. In other words, there's at least four that you have to have emotionally. And this would be kind of like lowest common denominator in math terms, or maybe primary colors and color terms, that everybody has at least these four emotions that we experience. Happiness, sadness, anger, and fear. And God has wired us as human beings to experience all four of those. So happiness, sadness, anger, and fear. On the other end, and if I get this wrong, for those of you who are emotional uh, scholars, uh, Robert Pluchik, I'm going to call him Pluchik, 
uh, has 27. And this is his wheel of emotions. And you can see there, there's 27. But in a way, there's not. In a way, a lot of these are just intensity. Like, there's different levels of intensity on a lot of these, and he expresses those at different emotions. For example, anger could be very intense, like a rage. Some of it could be a lot more mild, like annoyance. So all of those could be expressed, but he's saying there's many different intensities and there may be different combinations of the two, just like when you have colors, put a couple primary colors together and get another color. So he basically looks at it as there's 27 or so ways that our emotions get expressed. But we at least have four, maybe 27. So when we're looking at this today, we're looking at how do we use and express our emotions in a way that honors God. Since the word emotion is not in the Bible, I looked it up in the dictionary, and this is what it says. A mental reaction such as anger or fear, subjectively experienced as strong feeling, usually directed toward a specific object, and typically accompanied by a physiological and behavior change in your body. So I think that that's interesting about the physiological side of it. Because a lot of us, that's how we know the emotion that we're feeling. We might have tears physiologically that we experience. Or we might have tensing up physiologically that we experience. Or we might have sweaty palms or faster heartbeat going on physiologically. Or our voice might go louder physiologically. These are things that we experience in our body that kind of clue us in to what's going on emotionally in us. So emotions come out into our body and go out through our body. But when we talk about emotions, it's really, we're looking at that feeling side. And there's two sides to it. There's a destructive side to our feelings, and there's a holy side to our feelings. They can be used for either. So Jesus, I'm going to use our primary example. What was his emotions like? How did he experience these things? Hebrews chapter 4, 15, it says, We do not have a high priest, Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So there's no emotion that Jesus did not experience, and there's no temptation he did not experience to use those emotions in a negative way. But Jesus always turned that around and used it the way that God wanted him to. So if we look at how Jesus used his emotions, we can get an idea of what does it mean to use your emotions in a holy way. Now emotions can also be manipulated to help us do things that aren't necessarily what God would want us to do. And we can overemphasize our emotions sometimes, or we can underemphasize our emotions. And in worship, both sides can happen. Some churches overemphasize the emotional response. In other words, we would get the sense that I know that I experience God in worship because, and then they would usually put an emotional thing in there. Because I was in tears, or because I was full of joy, or because I had this feeling I felt the presence of God. And all of those are good, and I am for them. And I hope that by the end, we will have more emotional connection with God, not less. But sometimes, that's how we, in some circles, equate, yes, God moved. Yes, God was here. How do you know? Well, this emotion happened, or that emotion happened, or I felt this. Or on the flip side, I, 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 didn't, I didn't feel the presence of God here. I didn't feel anything. And while, yes, we should be moved in our feelings, that's not the be-all, end-all of worship. Sometimes, too, people want to substitute feelings for truth. And this happens sometimes in a more progressive or liberal-style church, where they might say, well, that just makes people feel bad. We can't preach those kinds of messages because they don't feel good about the lifestyle choices that they're making. Well, truth is truth. You may or may not feel good about the truth that's coming your way. In fact, if you are living in a way that the Bible tells you not to, you're probably not going to feel too good when it tells you to. So feelings are not the be-all, end-all. But on the other side, we shouldn't feel like there's no uh, reason to experience feelings in worship. Sometimes we just stir up those feelings a little more. So let's look at seven in the Bible. The first one's compassion. Jesus had compassion. Now, when I look this up in the, in the Greek dictionary, this actually literally can be translated this way. Moved in the bowels. All right? So, Jesus was literally moved in the bowels to make a response. 
So you might put it this way, a holy bowel movement. I'm sorry, but you know, that's, that's just what we're talking about here. But we use this phrase similar, don't we? Because someone might ask you this. When they're trying to think of what you feel about something, what's your gut telling you? And I'm thinking, my gut's telling me I need tons and more fiber. <laughs> like, you know, what is my gut telling me? We're not talking about your physical gut. We're not talking about Jesus was moved to his physical bowels. What we're saying here is this is a deep emotional feeling. It's a deep emotional response. It's not just something he thought about with his head. And in Matthew 9, 36, we see here that Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the crowds. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 14, 14. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them which moved him to action to heal. Yes, Jesus healed for the glory of God. Yes, Jesus healed to reveal he was Messiah. But he also healed because he had compassion. Compassion, on a positive sense, can lead us to take action to help people. We see Matthew 15, 32, when Jesus had a crowd that he was preaching to. I have compassion on these people. They've been with me three days and had nothing to eat. I don't want to send them away hungry, so he creates a miracle to feed them. So compassion can help us to take action, to help people in their time of need, to minister to them. And sometimes it's that deep down feeling inside that will move us to finally do something. We might think with our head, oh yes, I should help people. But until sometimes we feel that emotion in our heart, we feel that compassion, we don't take the action. And that's what it's designed to do. And in Corinthians, Paul's writing to the church trying to stir them up to give, but he also gives something to be aware of, a warning. And I want to show you some of the negative side, if you will, of compassion. You might say, how can there be a negative side of compassion? Well, if it gets manipulated, look at 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. We can give compulsively sometimes. What does that mean? It means someone is manipulating your emotions to get something out of you so you get it. This happened to me my first year, my first week in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I went to a week-long uh, set of services. They brought in special speakers, nationally known people from the TV. All, all came in, and they all raised offerings. And they got you excited to give. They got you worked up to give. And I gave a lot that first week of school. <laughs> and all of a sudden, my bank account went from here to here after that first week of giving. And then God led me to this verse and said, okay, from now on, you pray about it. You decide what you're going to give before you get to church and don't change your mind. <laughs> so I started writing my check out before I got there. I did it this morning. Sorry about that. But at that time, I started doing that so I would know I'm going to give ahead of time this amount. This is what I've already decided hard to give. This is what I can cheerfully give. But sometimes we give for the wrong reasons. We give maybe because someone's manipulating us, working on our emotions, or we don't want to look bad in someone else's eyes. But notice, people can be master manipulators for your emotions. And they can get you to give things, whether it be a, a company, or whether it be a ministry, whether it be uh, someone who's uh, uh, abusing or uh, addicted, or whatever, they can homeless, they can work on your emotions to get you to give something. That you really weren't being moved by God to do, it was just someone manipulating your emotions. So we have to recognize emotions can be a good thing to take action, but we don't want to be manipulated in taking that action and then regret it later. We want to make sure that it's something God's leading us to do. Number two, I'm going to take off the CLN. We're going to talk about passion. Now, this is a big one in our world today. People talk about what are you passionate about and, you know, follow your passion. And in reality, the biblical definition of passion is not what people use today. In fact, it more fits with zeal, which is our next one. But in passion, there's two ways it's used in the Bible. The first one is Titus 2.12, and it's a bad thing. It, the grace of God, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and no to worldly passions. So some of our passions are bad. Some of our strong desires for things are bad. And God's grace teaches us to say no to it. In fact, Titus 3.3 3 says at one time we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and slaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. So just because you have a strong desire for something doesn't make it good. And just to say, well, I want to do this because I feel like I want to, that's not the best way to decide. 
The best way to decide is, is this passion, this desire, this intense longing, is that from God? And if it's not, I need to say no to that. The only one positive way that this word actually gets used, it's in the King James Version, Acts 1-3. Jesus showed himself alive after his passion. Well, what was Jesus' passion? Was Jesus' passion just something he really enjoyed, something that he was really excited about? Was that what he was talking about? No, it was talking about his death on the cross. It was talking about his suffering. If you've seen the movie The Passion of the Christ or heard about Passion Week or The Passion Place, what are we talking about? Laying down your life and suffering and dying. So my question for you, if you're passionate about something, are you willing to suffer and lay down your life and die? Because that was Jesus' passion. That was the early apostles' passion. He told his followers, pick up your cross and follow me. Pick up your cross means be ready to suffer. Not just be ready to have something you're excited about. So that's passion. Number three is zeal or anger. Now zeal here is the biblical world that, a word that fits better with passion, the way we would describe it. But zeal can be a good thing. It also borders on anger. And, border, and anger can be a good thing if used correctly. So look at John 2. Jesus, uh, at the Passover, he went up to Jerusalem in the temple courts. He found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves. Now, selling cattle, sheep, and doves was not a problem. It was the fact that they were using it in a bad way and exploiting people. And so Jesus made a whip out of cords, drove them from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins and overturned their tables. That'll make a scene. <laughs> Jesus comes with a whip. Jesus starts driving out the sheep and cattle. He's turning over the tables. And to those who sold those, in verse 16, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And his disciples remembered in the Old Testament, it's written, zeal for your house will consume me. What did Jesus have? He had zeal. Zeal is more like what we would use for passion. Zeal is something that really drives your energy, and it can border on anger. Because Jesus here had some anger toward how these people were responding in the temple. So his zeal came out. In fact, God has anger. Look at Hebrews 3.11. God uh, is they're reminding the Hebrews of this in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God declared, on, on oath, in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. So God does have anger. Does, God does have wrath. God uses anger. But we need to recognize God's anger and our anger are not always the same. Look at James 1.19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So we have a caution on our anger. We need to be slow to become angry. Because our anger so quickly can become bad anger. Now, I, I, I liken anger to fire because fire can be a great thing. It does a lot of good benefits for us. But anger can quick, or fire can quickly get out of control and fire can quickly hurt people. And if we don't use it correctly, it's going to be damaging. Same thing with anger. It can quickly get out of control. It can quickly become a bad thing. So we have some cautions about it. Look at Ephesians 4.31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. We need to get rid of the rage. Get rid of the anger. And um, those are not a positive thing for us. So we sense the anger coming up in our heart. We ask ourselves, is this from God? And if not, then we, what we can't do, and I'm hoping to help us see here with our emotions, we can't just say, oh, well, I'm angry, I'm just going to react anyway. Because God wants us to use something called self-control. To not just let the anger take over and respond. Now, Paul talked about zeal. He had zeal. And I'm going to skip ahead here um, to Philippians 3.6. He says the same thing repeatedly throughout the New Testament. But Philippians 3, 6, as for zeal, Paul said, I had so much zeal, I was persecuting the church. Paul said, I was one of the most zealous people there was for the law and for Moses and even persecuting the church. And he thought that was a good thing until I found out it was a bad thing. And then he's talking to these Judaizers in Galatia, Galatians 4, 18. It's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good. So there is positive uses of zeal. But again, we need to be careful and make sure it doesn't become a negative thing. Romans 10, 2. 
He says, I can testify about them. They are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. So zeal alone is not good enough as to connect with the truth. So here's our conclusion, Ephesians 4, 26. In your anger, do not sin. Or the King James says, be angry and sin not. Which means we can be angry, but we don't have to be sinful. And the wisdom here is not to let the sun go down when you're still angry, because if you do, if you keep stewing on that throughout the night, and you wake up the next morning with that, it can often go from anger to bitterness. It can often take root then in your heart, and then you can become a bitter person on a regular basis. Not just temporarily dealing with anger, but long-term dealing with anger. And then you become a bitter person. So God wants us to use zeal and anger in a positive way. It can be a good thing. Jesus did. But it can also be something we can be very careful of and very cautious of not to use in a negative way. The next one is joy or rejoicing, which often gets expressed in laughing and dancing and clapping. Nehemiah 8 9, you've heard me preach about this several times. But when they came back into the promised land, being in exile, they were there in Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. And Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra the priest, the teacher of the law, the Levites who were instructing the people, said to them all, this day is holy. That's my theme this year. Holy, set apart, special for God. There was one holy day a year they were to fast and weep. This was not it. This day is holy, O Lord our God. Do not mourn and do not weep. Mourning, weeping, and fasting go together. And it, not, was the, it was not the expression that they wanted that day for <coughs> Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets is to be a celebration holiday. And I love uh, making sure we understand, again, holiday comes from Holy Day, a day special and set apart for God. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Notice they were experiencing emotions. Their emotions were weeping. They were grieving. They were sad. They were mourning. And at this time, Nehemiah and Ezra said, we need to change our emotions. God's will for you right now is not weeping and mourning. We'll talk about that one in a minute. But right now, he's saying God's will for you is joy. So instead of fasting and weeping and mourning, Nehemiah 8.10, go and enjoy some choice food and sweet drinks. And some of you say, that's all I need to hear, Pastor. I'm on my way. I'm going to go apply Nehemiah 8.10 right now. I'm going to have some choice food and sweet drinks. We'll see you. Send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy. To the Lord our God. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Sometimes God is saying, I want you to use the joy. Not a time for mourning, not a time for weeping, not a time for grieving. We need to know when God wants us to, when God wants us to joy. And joy can be a source of strength for us. It can be a source of energy for us. Notice a lot of times when we're grieving and we're weeping and we're mourning and we're fasting, we don't have much energy. We don't have much strength to do what God's calling us to do or to serve others. But when we have a sense of joy, when we have eaten the right foods and drank the right drinks, we can have the energy we need to go out and do what God's called us to do. So Nehemiah 8.11, the Levites calmed all the people saying, Be still, for this is the holy day. Do not grieve. Now, Jesus was accused of this in Matthew eleven nineteen. 19. The Son of God came eating and drinking. And they said, here's a glutton and a drunkard. So they accused Jesus of eating and drinking too much. Why? Because he was often celebrating. They said, John's disciples fast. The Pharisees fast. Why don't you and your disciples fast? And he says, well, can they fast if the bridegroom is with them? This is a season of joy. It's not a season of mourning. This is not a season of grief. Yes, there'll come a time when they'll grieve. This is not it. This is a time to celebrate. This is a time for joy. And eating and drinking was a sign of that. And Jesus had the sign of joy. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Again, there are times for grieving and mourning. But the, the normal state of a believer should be a rejoicing and a joy. Psalm 1611, which I don't have on there, but I want to add, in the fullness of your presence, or in your presence there is fullness of joy, Psalm 1611. What are we going to have in eternity? The fullness of the presence of God, which will be the fullness of joy. He'll wipe away the tears. No more mourning. No more crying. No more pain. That's temporary. Joy lasts forever. 
Pain and suffering and grief are temporary. Joy is higher. It's the more dominant thing that we should experience. Love will last forever. Love and joy. The next one, fear. When the, and often expresses itself in anxiety and worry and stress. or smaller forms of fear. We're not often in flat out like, terror most of our time. But some of us live in moderate fear on a regular basis. With anxiety, with worry, with stress. That's moderate level fear on a consistent basis. Now, there is a positive fear. Isaiah 11 talks about this with the Messiah. A shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Isaiah 11, 2, the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. And it goes through all those. Notice the last one, the fear of the Lord. Verse 3 says he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. So the Messiah, Jesus, had a healthy fear of the Lord. He promoted that fear, but that was the only fear Jesus had. He had no other fear. And that's what he wants for our lives, too, to live with a healthy fear of God and not fear anything else. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, with prayer petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So instead of fear, God wants us to turn that into prayer. 1 John 4, 18, there's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. So again, there are healthy fears, Fear of God. There's healthy fears to say, I shouldn't jump off that building. <laughs> I shouldn't stand in front of that truck. <laughs> you know, there are healthy fears. But dominant in the Christian should not be a moderate level of fear on a regular basis. Again, sadness and grief. We'll talk about this in a minute. But the dominant response of a Christian should be joy. The dominant response of a Christian should not be fear. Number seven, sadness and grief. Six, sorry. Shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus, there you go. So can, can you be holy and cry? Yes. <laughs> okay? Rejoice the Lord always does not mean never cry. Obviously, Jesus was weeping. Where was he weeping? He was at a funeral. He had his friend. In a tomb. Lazarus. He was seeing his sisters, his loved ones. He wanted to express that grief as well. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, it tells us, not, don't misread this, it doesn't say do not grieve. It says that we grieve with hope. We have a hope in our grief. It doesn't mean never grieve. It doesn't mean we can't express that loss and that sadness and that hurt that we're feeling. It just means we have hope in the midst of it. We know there's a future. We know there's a heaven. We know there's a resurrection. We know there's more to come. We know God is with us. We have hope in the midst of our grief. Doesn't mean we never grieve. Yes, expressing crying, expressing sadness, expressing grief is a healthy thing. Jesus tells his disciples in John 16, 20, you're going to weep and you're going to mourn while the world rejoices. You're going to grieve, but your grief will eventually turn to joy. And for all of us, our grief will eventually turn to joy. Grief will not last forever. But it doesn't mean we can't express seasons and times of grief. Hebrews 5, 7. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears. Jesus cried. Jesus had tears. Jesus expressed sorrow. Paul had tears when he was talking to the church in Philippi. As I have told you before, I now tell you again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. That brought Paul tears. I preached the gospel, and people rejected. Not because he's upset that they're rejecting him. He's upset that they're rejecting Christ, and they're missing eternity because they're rejecting the gospel. That brought him tears. 2 Corinthians 2.4, I wrote you out of great distress, anguish in my heart, many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Paul said, I had to write some hard things to you, Corinthians, not because I wanted to grieve you, but because I wanted you to get on the right track with God. And that brought him distress. That brought him grief. That brought him tears. Sometimes when you see your children, for example, doing making decisions that you don't want them to make, that can bring you grief. That can bring you anguish. That can bring you distress. 
You want them to change. You want them to live differently. It's because you love them. 2 Corinthians 7, 9, Paul says, now I'm happy. Not because you were made sorry. I'm not happy you were sorry, but I'm happy for what the sorry produced. It led you to repentance. You became sorrowful as God intended. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 says, godly sorrow brings repentance and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. There's two types of sorrow we can enter into. And sometimes we need to hear the truth, get godly sorrow, so we want to change, we want to repent. Sometimes when you really experience God, it's because you experience deep conviction in your heart. What I'm doing is wrong. I need to repent. I need to change. Jonathan Edwards experienced that and began the first great awakening. He preached a title that most of us would never want to hear today. I'm not sure they wanted to hear it then. And the title was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And by the time he was done, people were weeping over their sin and calling out for repentance. And the first great awakening began in America because of tears of godly sorrow. It was a good thing that they repented, not a good thing they were sorry. God, worldly sorrow brings death. Worldly sorrow is being sorry about the wrong things. Self-focused, selfish, self-centered, self-pity. When we have selfish, self-centered, self-pity tears, those are not good. In fact, I've been convicted of God at times over my self-pity tears. So you quit, quit crying over yourself, okay? But if you want to cry, cry about your sin. Cry about the things that hurt God. Cry about people who don't know the Lord. Cry about loved ones that are lost. Don't just be self-pity. Number seven. Peace and serenity. Again, this should be a normal state for Christians. Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, with prayer, petition, present your request to God. Verse 7. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds. And down to verse 9. The peace of God will be with you. John 14, 27. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. So Jesus had peace and he gives it to us. I do not give you as the world gives. In other words, I'm not going to give you perfect circumstances. I'm not going to take away all your problems, but I will give you peace. So do not let your hearts be troubled or do not be afraid. Don't let your emotions get out of control. You can receive my peace, John 16, 33. I have told you these things, so in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Just, that's the truth. In the world you will have trouble. King James says, tribulations. But take heart, he says, I have overcome the world. So Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so you can overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I want you to see, for every emotion, there's a positive side, there's a negative side. Our emotions are going to come, they're going to rise up. What do we do with them when we get them? So here's my challenge. Number one, read a psalm or two every day this week. Because the psalms connect us to our emotions. In fact, the psalms so often are written with emotions in mind. And my second challenge is to use your emotions for worship every day this week. This is the positive side. That's where I want to say, yes, it's not all about emotions. But neither should your worship be emotionless. <clears throat> you should not just have no emotion in your worship. I mean, how many of you want someone to express their love for you with zero emotion? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> how about a little emotion here, all right? You know, express something. So we can I express our love, yes. It doesn't have to be all emotional, but emotion helps. Maybe there's some things you've never done in worship. Maybe this week you step out of your comfort zone, you do some things you've never done. Maybe you close your eyes in worship, not while driving. <laughs> Lord Jesus, take the wheel. No, don't do that. Okay? Clap your hands. Dance. Shout. Laugh. Cry. Sing. All of these are emotional ways to worship. You know, some of you are not raised to worship emotionally. But God wants us to. Here's a few. Psalm 47, verse 1. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God for Christ's joy. 
Well, that's good for some, but not for me. Clap your hands. Oh, right? And let's not let worldly things get all of our emotions. Let's, I just, I mean, seriously, if you can go to a ball game and not even know a person on the field and get emotional, but, but I don't get emotional for Jesus. You don't get emotional for a guy you've never met <laughs> who's making a bunch of money and probably sinning with it. <laughs> That just makes me so emotional. <laughs> so clap your hands for God. Shout for God. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. Dancing is sinful. Well, God said you could praise him with dancing. I don't think he said that was sinful. <laughs> now, you can sin with some forms of dancing. Not every form is sinful. Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Sing for what? Joy. There's some emotion there, right? Shout aloud. Let us extol him with thanksgiving and music and song. Let's bow down in worship. Let's kneel. Now I'm going to talk about some of these again. Preview next week. Because we're going to talk about using our body for worship. But our bodies and our emotions are tied together. Number three. Use art for worship every day this week. Now, you know me by now. I'm always for scripture, 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 scripture. Get it? Okay, I'm not saying instead of scripture. But along with that, <coughs> examples are music, meditation, sounds, pictures, paintings, movies. Why? Because art often connects our emotions. And usually we think it's good art when our emotions are connected. We don't usually think it's good art when there's no emotion there. Wow, that's a nice streak of white paint. <laughs> <laughs> There's usually something in the picture that draws you to that, that makes you get an emotion. Or music. Do you like music with no emotion? I feel nothing with that song. Let's hear it again. <laughs> usually you want to feel something with the song that you're hearing. Right? The movies. You usually watch a movie. If you feel nothing during that movie, wow, that was a good movie. I felt nothing. There was no emotion behind it. No, you want to feel something. Now, some of us don't want our tears to be seen while we're watching the movie, right? Oh, just got a little, little uh, allergy. Yeah, don't, don't mind me. But you want to feel something in that, okay? Or the comedies. Why do you watch a comedy? You usually want to laugh. I'm watching a comedy. Just no laughter. I don't know. It's a good one, though. It's really good. I never laugh, but it's a good comedy. Yeah. Okay, number four. Spend some time outside or in silence. Why outside? Because sometimes when I get outside, my emotions get stirred a little more. I start seeing God's creation. I start seeing the things that God has put out there. It stirs my emotions more sometimes. Or just sitting in silence trying to get all the noise out, all those wrong thoughts out, so I can just focus on the presence of God. And that's where I'm more likely to experience peace. Again, maybe not falling down laughing or rejoicing or whatever, but I can have peace often in silence. And that's often when I'm seeking peace, I'll seek for silence. And my kids are like, hey, Dad! <laughs> seeking peace. <laughs> <laughs> Number five, this is my encouragement to you. Dedicate your emotions to God and his purposes this week. And if needed, I say this with a lot of things. Our emotions are all over the place for a lot of different reasons. And some of us are more naturally more emotional than others. And some of us have had emotions hurt us, or we have things that trigger our emotions in a negative way, or our emotions are a little bit out of control at times. It's, it's not a bad thing to get help. It's not a bad thing to see a counselor, psychologist, whoever, and say, can you just help me work through some of my emotions? I've had some emotions that I needed to deal with, and sometimes they're helpful and sometimes they're not. And I would like some help. Well, that's what they're there for, okay? So feel free to get help for your emotions. Say, my anxiety gets out of control sometimes, or sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm depressed, or sometimes I'm full of grief, or whatever, and I just need help. 
I can't control my anger, whatever it is, get some help. Let someone work through that with you and try to help you use your emotions the way that God wants. And let's put them in his purposes, his plans, and show some emotion in our worship of God. Let's pray. God, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for our emotions that you've given us. Jesus, we thank you for the example. You are an emotional person, but you always used them for God's glory. You always use them to benefit other people. We're sinful. You understand that. You can sympathize with our weaknesses. You know the ways our emotions sometimes get out of control. But God, I pray today that you will help us heal the areas we need healing and help us use our emotions for your glory and your purposes. And be honored this week with our holy emotions. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.